Thank you guys for that message about, and thank you Brother Jim, that message about carrying Christ. And I want to talk about that today in a two-part message, two Sundays on our mission. What does it mean to carry Christ? And I want to turn to a scripture about the end of time in Matthew, the 25th chapter, and read to you beginning with verse 31. A passage that you might find familiar, and I want you to think about the song that was sung. What does it mean to carry Christ? When the Son of Man comes, Matthew 25, verse 31, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come to me, come, who are, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes. You did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? And he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do, for one of these, of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. When we see what is true at the beginning of life, and we see what is true at the end of life, we can then align ourselves to the truth throughout our life. That's true for us as individuals, and it's true for our church, and I'm going to be focusing on the latter. What's true at the beginning and true at the end directs our life and at both ends what we see is the law of love. At the beginning of time, a law existed according to which all things were made. Everything was created by this law of love were people. The two people who were first created, who were our foreparents of all of us, they were created to love God, love him enough to obey him, and to love each other, love them enough, the other enough to be there for them and to seek the other's good. They were created from the beginning because Adam was there by himself and it was not good for him to be alone. So Adam, uh, God created Eve for Adam and since Eve was created of the rib from him. Naturally, Adam was there for Eve. And that mutual being there for each other was the beginning of how life was supposed to work. It was the law of love that did not have to be commanded because it's like the law of gravity. It was simply how we function together. 
And from that family unit where love is best able to flourish, we are to learn how to be neighbors to each other and how communities could function together and how nations could be there for each other. What was supposed to happen is what theologians call is that the heart was to be curved outward. Now get this image. The heart curved outward toward God in love so that we might obey him. Curved outward toward the other person so that we might exist for that person. And at the beginning of time, this law of love was written into every fiber of creation on the mind and heart of every person so that the most natural thing is for the heart to curve outward toward the other and be there for them. Why, though there were no rules needed, because once your heart is curved outward, once you love the other, the many possibilities that love creates cannot be contained in a book. It begins with, is your heart curved outward? Eve created for Adam. Adam, therefore Eve. And that was to be the pattern. From the beginning of time, people rejected that law of love and instead chose self-justification, self-advancement, self-glorification and the results were murderous. They were spiritually murderous when people began to instead of curve their hearts toward God they began to do what? Their hearts curved inward toward themselves classic definition of sin that the theologians give us is that the heart is curved inward instead of outward. It's curved inward so they rejected God as God and instead created their own gods. That was idol worshiper, a particularly pernicious, harmful spiritually thing. It was spiritually toxic and noxious and fatal. And their hearts curved inward instead of toward the other person. So instead of being there for the other person, instead we began to look out to make sure that the other person was there for us. And it was murderous. The kind of acrimony that quickly existed was exhibited in that first family. When Cain and Abel... A sheep farmer, he had meat. A crop farmer, he had vegetables, he had fruits. They needed each other to have a good meal. Just to have a good meal, they needed each other. One person's sacrifice found greater favor with God, the other person didn't. And instead of repenting, saying, what, what is it, God, that I need to do within? What, how do I need to change? How do I need to repent? Instead, Cain decided to simply turn his heart inward, curved inward, and the result was murderous. Clearly, people failed to obey God. And this law of love that existed from the beginning, that was rejected from the beginning, was to live for the other's good. That's our hearts curved outward. That's what it was at the beginning. People soon lost the idea of what love even is, and soon the heart curved inward so naturally, so was such a familiar path, the heart curved inward that God had to set up some rules. So say, don't let this happen because that's your heart curving inward. Don't have another God before me. That's your heart curving inward. You're creating your own God instead of toward me. Don't create graven images. Don't Misuse the name of the Lord your God. Don't neglect the Sabbath because that day I created all of them. That day belongs to me. That's your heart curving outward. Don't dishonor your parents. Honor them. Because when you feel like dishonoring them, your heart is curving inward and you cut off the succession of wisdom. Don't murder, obviously. Don't commit adultery. It kills families. Don't, don't in any way... Uh, do those things that express your heart curving inward, coveting, stealing, lying about the other person. All of those things were preventative, saying when, when you start doing this, that's your heart curving inward, so don't. Jesus came along. The Ten Commandments, of course, were then, and the prophets spelled all 
spelled it all out in terms of what not to do. Don't let your hearts curve inward. And Jesus said it all could really be summarized like this. The same thing that was there from the beginning. Love the Lord your God, heart curved outward. Love your neighbor as yourself, heart curved outward. Instead of your heart curving inward. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And you'll have all of those rules. You won't need those rules against your heart curving inward because you are now curving outward. That was the way it was from the beginning. When Jesus tried to find an example of somebody whose heart was curved outward, he couldn't he did not point to any one live person. Instead, he developed a parable. It's called the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because here was a person who didn't have anything to do with this individual who was unknown, no national origin mentioned, just this man who was hurting, who was robbed, he was beaten and bleeding on the side of the road. And here was a person who we don't know very much about him except that he was not of the primary religious group the Jews. He was a Samaritan. And that person, instead of the two priests, my profession, whose heart were curved inwards because they were so busy with their own religion, their own self-justification that they forgot to turn their, curve their heart outward toward that person who has a need. But the Samaritan didn't. He was there. And he lived for the other's good, the law of love. He was aligned with what was true at the beginning and what will meet us again at the end. Cain failed. The Samaritan did it, but he was only a parable. And each one of us, on that final day, will face that. Now when somebody does fulfill this law of love, when their heart is curved outward, then you know what happens? People see that as kind of like a light in the world. Let your light so shine, Jesus said, that they may see your what? Good deeds. The specific ways that your heart curves outward. Let them see that. And when the world sees someone whose heart is not curved inward but curves outward, you know what it does? It reminds them of God because it says they will give praise to your heavenly Father. When the world sees somebody whose heart is curved outward in specific, tangible ways. Now everybody knows about the law of love. It seems, it's so inbred in our world that nobody misses it. The poets write about it. The singers sing about it. All you need is love. We hear about it all the time. Philosophers dialogue and monologue about it. Parents preach it to their children and children would like to have it from their parents and their peers. Everybody wants it. Everybody knows it and even will condemn others for not showing it. But it is not so easy when it comes to ourselves to have our hearts curved outward in those specific ways that meet another person's need even if we don't know them. But the world says, wow, that's like a light bulb. You understand it and our whole world seems to get this. We even have phrases now that we use that is not even related to the church. Give it, pay it forward, give back, uh, make a difference, which is the phrase that we've adopted. Now in the end, the law of love will be the measuring stick. You saw someone who was hungry and you fed them. And speaking of the emphasis that we have in the next two weeks and as part of our missions program, you saw someone thirsty and you found a way to get them clean water. And you were a part of that, making that happen. Heart curved outward. Or you could say, yeah, there's people who have bad water, too bad for them because here we are, we have all kinds of water and the heart curves inward and we stop caring. Someone was in prison and you visited them. Somebody was sick, somebody was a stranger, and you invited him in, made him feel at home, heart curved outward stuff. And on that day of judgment, we'll be divided up into two groups according to this measuring stick. And there will be a surprise. On the one side, those who've been, who, who uh, the Bible says, those who hearts were curved outward and they saw those needs and they did it, and they never realized it was Jesus. But Jesus exists among those who have the great needs. 
And we will find Jesus in the poor, those who are powerless, those who are hurting, not necessarily economically poor, but feeling the emotional poverty of rejection. And you were there for them. Your heart was curved outward and Jesus will say, come, come into my kingdom because you did that for me. And they'll say, when did we didn't even recognize you? I mean, I know what your picture looks like. And I didn't recognize you. It was when you did it for one of those who had need. Your heart was curved out. And then he'll say to those who, who, who saw the same needs, but their hearts were curved in, so they neglected and rejected and didn't do those things. And they were specific things. Hungry, feed, thirsty, give water, sick. You were a stranger. You were, you were imprisoned. You needed somebody to be there for you, but you neglected it. And you say, go for me. And they will then turn to self-justification. They will say, Lord, I didn't see you. I have an excuse. I am justified because I didn't see you. And Jesus, of course, is going to tell them when you saw the least, the powerless, those who did not have, the have-nots, if you didn't do it for them, you didn't do it for me. And then they will further try to, the Bible says, Jesus tells us, they will try to self-advance. And they'll say, Lord, here's what we did do for you. We drove out demons in your name. We had amazing miracles. We did such powerful religious acts that the world was amazed. They were rather impressed with us. I mean, you. And Jesus will say, I didn't exist in that. It was about that person who was hungry, that person who was thirsty, the person who was a stranger and didn't have a friend, that person who was in prison and needed someone who would give them another chance. It'd be some, there was that person who was thirsty and you walked for water, but you didn't, you neglected it. There was that person who was sick and you just hoped that they would get better. It'd be nice if they did, but did not do anything to help them. And he said, that's where I lived. You can do all those great religious things, have super churches, powerful miracles. You can do all those things, but it comes down to, is your heart curved outward? Or has your heart become curved inward? So in the end, that law of love will be our measuring stick. And you say, I'm, I, how will it be for me? Well, the truth is, Consistency is expected. That we consistently have our hearts curved outward. Consistently. And how will it be for us? We will be found guilty. We did not always notice and do something about what we did notice. We neglected, we rejected. You can go back to the playground in your elementary school days and there was that time that one kid was ostracized and you had the opportunity to be a friend because he was a stranger and he felt it. But you thought, ah, what will that do to my reputation? It only got worse when you got into high school and then you backed away and tried to do the social ladder climbing thing and everyone says, oh, that was me. And then you're starting off and you just barely have enough money to scrape together to pay the bills because we tend to live up to our income. Have you noticed that too? <laughs> and really there is something to share. There is something we could share, but we didn't. Oh, someday later I'll do that. Someday later and then we already have this pattern and it's impossible to undo those things, to undo the impact of what we neglected and rejected. And so we'll need a Savior. We'll need Jesus who forgives us. That's why Jesus in another place, when he was asked, what are the works we could do, we should do to gain eternal life? As though somehow we could do enough works, do enough to get eternal life. And Jesus said, no, no, that's not the way it works. Because your heart was already curved inward. And, it, and even when you, those times you're curved outwards, it doesn't make up for those times it was curved inward. We need a Savior. And so he said, the work of God is to believe in the one who sent him. That's our message. Everyone is found guilty on this law of love that we all agree exists. We don't need to have the rules of the Ten Commandments. We were created that way, and in the end we'll face that. And we're found guilty, every one of us. We need a Savior, someone who will forgive us.
But when we come into Christ Jesus, we are then recreated spiritually to do good works. What are those good works? Those works you see somebody who comes out of prison or an addicted lifestyle, you give them another chance. Hence the another chance Christ's ministry. Someone who's thirsty, you find a way to get them water. Hunger. You are there, your heart curved outward for the good of the other person. That's the law of love. We need a Savior. Savior does not somehow nullify what has been true at the beginning and true at the end. And what we need to do is have enough wisdom to align our life so that we fit into what has always been true, be there for each other, what will face us at the end, did you, were you there for the other, was your heart curved which way? Outward. Or was your heart curved inward? For about a year, our church's elders, myself, the pastors, we've been working on realigning our church so that our mission, our footprint in this community and in the world would be aligned with what is true from the beginning, true the end, and we're calling it Make a Difference. Hence, you're seeing a lot of make a difference things. We've been saying, let's make a difference. Why? That aligns us with what has always been true from the beginning, will be true in the end, and it directs our life all the way through. There are some things that are important to us, our values, and you see them posted. Worshiping God, that is a value. We, we will always do that. That's important to us. We believe in the truth, the Bible. And believing in the truth is a value. And that truth that's preached here is a value that we will always uphold. And that truth ought to transform lives. It should make us holy. It ought to make us like Christ. And we will do things that help transformation occur. Small groups, Sunday school, all the different ways that we and expect the Word of God to change us. If the Word of God doesn't change us, then we really don't believe it. And we're not worshiping God, we're just coming to church. But in the end, that is what aligns us with what was true at the beginning, true at the end. It's our heart curved outward. We're trying to make a difference. And we're calling on everyone to be a part of it. First of all, I have to ask myself, have I lived with an inward curve so that I'm protecting myself, advancing myself, justifying it all? Or have I taken the risk of being outward curved? You know the answer. And you know that you need a Savior, Jesus Christ. Because it is only through the power of the resurrection that an inward curved heart can go beyond the Ten Commandments to the law of love that has manifold possibilities and curve outward. Only Jesus can change that in us. And he needs to forgive us. We need a Savior. And we need to align ourselves with this mission. Will you? These altars are open. If you come to this side, I'll know you just want to pray about something by yourself. If you come to this side, a pastor will pray for you. And I invite many of us to come forward. Maybe it is to just to realign your own heart. Know that our church is trying to realign ourselves so that we go and make a difference. And maybe you need to realize for the first time. So, you know, I thought I was being good and good enough, but I really do need a Savior because I haven't been consistently outwardly curved. There have been times I've had the inward curve. Today, Jesus has come to me. And he invites you to come. Stand with me, please, would you? And Father, we come to you because we know we need you. Too often, our hearts have been curved inward. Today, we confess that. We confess it's been true in our family life where love has the greatest possibility. It's been true between neighbors, between people, between communities and nations. It's been true about us. We come to you asking you to forgive us. Make us those people whose hearts are curved outward. Help us to make a difference. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.